This channel is not intended for children. Please kickstart responsibly. Hey everybody, so we got a lot of holidays for this deal uh, in July. We've got Canada Day kicking it off, at the same time as International Joke Day. I don't know why they are the same one. World UFO Day, uh, in, then uh, Stay Out of the Sun Day, Independence Day, Asaha Puja, First Day of Nidoc, Bikini Day, Kissing Day, Fried Chicken Day, Strawberry Sunday Day, Game Day, or sorry, Video Game Day, Sugar Cookie Day, None of It Day, that is a culture, and, and National Kitten Day, and National Pina Colada Day. So, whatever you're going to celebrate, international, you know, U.S. independence, whatever you want. This is uh, going to be a shorter episode. Happy all of those things. And uh, if you hear some explosions in the background, it's because somebody is celebrating at least one of those. And uh, I'll just keep talking, and, you know, whatever happens, happens. It's going to be safe in my little bunker, you know. I've been holed up in for months, so no worries on that end. We'll just see what we got. Like I said, it's going to be cut short, and if I have to do a supplemental release, I'll do that later. Uh, we got a one of the people that I follow on YouTube is now following me, so what's up, Quackalope? Like a lot of your coverage, and you can see his stuff if you check out these campaigns, which you can do by checking out the descriptions, and uh, you'll be able to click on all of them. You can jump ahead to anything that you want to, and now that uh, there's timestamps in the, uh, the time bar, you'll be able to uh, jump ahead, even if you just uh, use your remote or phone or whatever, you should be able to make that work. That being said, let's see what's going on for the next couple weeks. First up we have some models. This is the Troll Dwarf and Ogre, and the first thing I looked at the Troll, I was like, it's got two heads, is that an Etten? And I was like, oh, it's got hair. I was like, oh, that's what they're doing with it. So you can make your decision on which ones you'd like or not like up to you. They are ready to paint, so they say that you don't need primer on it. I say anytime they say you don't need primer, put primer on, on anyway, and you just won't be disappointed. And uh, you can kind of go from there. So if any of these things are things you need, the dwarf is kind of cool that it's riding uh, an auroch or uh, ox, that kind of thing. And they got little tiny legs, right? The, if you listen to Gimli, they make wonderful sprinters, just not a long distance runner. So, you know, maybe they got to take long distance with their little house on the back of a beast of burden. That's kind of cool. Then we have a roll and write game that was a previous board game. Now it's just a roll and write version. This is Alhambra Roll and Write by Queen Games. These folks are always out here on Kickstarter and they're always making new versions of their games so that uh, it's more accessible to folks. A um, lot less money in uh, most circumstances or bigger collections that are uh, compiled down into uh, single boxes and that kind of thing. And this is the situation here. You uh, have a dice mechanic that's been introduced and that helps you do the scoring. So what you're going to end up with is a smaller box with a bunch of pads in it and it's going to include uh, a mega box that has uh, some other expansions and that type of uh, thing in it, which is kind of neat. It's uh, for eight and up. Uh, I'm sure that an eight-year-old can handle the math, so there's no multiplication or anything like that, but by being able to see how the dice grid out, it might actually help them understand multiplication tables and how that all works, so you know that might be something to consider if uh, you do have a younger child and you want a game for them, um, but otherwise it's, uh, it's a tableau builder and uh, you know something that doesn't take up a lot of space and chances are pretty high that you're not going to go through all the, the the written pads but the price is low enough where if you did run through it because you love the game that much you could just get more then for war gamers we have the ever popular battle of the bulge 1944 is popular because world war ii is super popular it is the biggest most current conflict out there for uh, this type of gaming so it's in people's memories the machines everybody thinks pretty cool so it's a popular uh, campaign. Uh, anyway, this is one of those, uh, it has the blocks, it has all the stats on it. Not a lot of art, very simple, but uh, that might not bother people that are really looking for the strategy aspect of it. Map and all that look fine, hex grids, that type of thing. And uh, if you're looking for some context to this, uh, it's in the Bastogne region and Band of Brothers, when they have to go and fight in Bastogne, is one of the most heart-wrenching 
moments of television for that episode. So you can watch that, and then maybe it'll get you enthused to, uh, to battle it out for yourself. Then for the people in England or Anglophiles out there, we have the Dreamstone 30th Anniversary Miniatures Collection and game that goes along with it. This is a cartoon that came out in between 1990 and 1995 for 52 episodes and has its own, uh, I wouldn't say unique, but you know, its own uh, flavor of uh, animation style. Um, if you're interested, if, yeah, I don't think there's any way we could have seen it in the U.S. Maybe you have to look it up on YouTube, and if you think that maybe you would be a fan, you think that the characters are cute looking or whatever, and then you want to uh, to find out more about it. Uh, otherwise, if you're in the U.K. and you want to evangelize uh, how good this show was, then you can check it out there. Um, it seems like a m younger skewing version of Dungeons & Dragons, uh, the cartoon, it seems to be uh, a best way to describe it. And, uh, yeah, if you find it interesting, go for it. It seems to have all of the, uh, the principles um, that were involved with the show also involved in uh, reintroducing this show uh, 30 years later in this form. So you can get uh, the RPG, and they also have like a tabletop game to go along with it. So you can uh, play however you would like to play. And then for Midland Miniatures, we have newly graduated wizards. So these folks are like level one. They're not the great grand evil or good or epic uh, version. As you can see, some of them are carrying around their books still. Um, they have a youthful look to them. Very, they look good in the sculpt uh, in the sense that they seem to be very energetic. You don't have uh, bearded faces. You have the uh, shaved faces for younger folks. So you can paint them however you like because they're going to be all made out of metal and delivered shiny. So you're going to have to do that yourself. And uh, keep in mind, if you do like these, Midland Miniatures has tons of other stuff that will make it fit within the same style. They have, um, I don't know if you want to call it terrain, but they have uh, definitely every type of like orc and goblin and hobgoblin, all that kind of stuff. Um, but they also have other things that you can get up to uh, spice up the uh, the scatter terrain and all that kind of thing available. They're always on these episodes, so uh, you know, just go back and ask them about whatever's currently available, and maybe they'll do a series two of uh, something that people need a lot of. Then we have Steve Jackson Games. This is the 2020 PDF challenge. You spend $3 is the basic amount, and then whatever comes up for the total for stretch goals, you unlock more and more. They have 12 PDFs that they were trying to do. They're currently at seven, and uh, you can look at all the stuff that's available. They are promoting the GURPS line. There's one and a half million copies of GURPS in print out there in the wild, so there's a lot of people to play it. If you are looking for the generic universal role-playing system that will fit any idea you've got, at least as a starting point to help you get whatever your ideas are out there, then uh, that's what GURPS is great for. It doesn't care uh, setting or uh, style or anything like that. It's just a system for resolving uh, conflicts and actions. And uh, it's been around for a really long time. And if you pay more than $3, they have a $30, $30 tier and a $99 tier, then they will give you additional credits to buy things that are not part of the campaign that are also in the PDFs. So if you do like the system, uh, I think if you pay on the $99 tier, you get $125 worth of credits. So it's a good way to get deliverables. It's all going to be PDF, so it'll be fast delivery, and you can get started right away, especially if you were missing out on something and you wanted to try out some new ideas you couldn't find in other places. And from Rebellion Studios, which is the people that make 2000 AD and the Judge Dredd comics, they've been around for a very long time. They have their own style to things. They have their own world in that Mega City world. If you haven't seen Dread with Carl Urban, it is the best of the Dread stuff. It is great. Great. If you have access to 3D, it was one of the best things even to see in 3D because the way that they do time effects and all that, uh, the way the drugs work, it was great. If you wanted to, say, play an RPG in that world and you want it simple and something that only uses D6s because you have a bunch of D6s laying around, and uh, you just want to jump into that mega city type of world created by those type of folks, Tartarus Gate, that's what you got. It is by those folks and it fits in that world. So uh, if you want to get your best dread on, give them a shot. Take a quick look at what they're offering. Artwork is all pretty good. I think that it is actually better than what you see in a lot of the uh, 2000 AD comic books. 
Um, it's not so super stylized, but still looking pretty good and very, very evocative because of that comic book root. And then we have The Dark Village. This is a novel, but it's not really a choose your own adventure. It's a, a narrative adventure with two separate endings. There are 10 different books that go along with it. I'm not sure if it's two per, uh, two endings per book or two at the end of the series, whatever the case is. It's neat. It, uh, it definitely has that fairy tale kind of feel to it. And um, it's something you can take with you if you just wanted to read, like you're waiting in line or whatever. You can do one of the different adventures as you go through. You're trying to find the history of the hero by going through and, and looking back. So maybe they're amnesiac, whatever the case is. It's, uh, it's pretty neat. And it's 16 pages a piece, so 160 pages total. It's not going to take you very long to get through it, but it might be something that's really worth it and something you can share with somebody else when you're done. If not, the pages and book look kind of pretty and they come in that uh, neat little box. So uh, maybe that'd be something that will look good on the shelf as well that you can revisit later. And you can revisit it twice to see if you can get the other ending. And then we have the Woodland Tribe, and this was suggested by a viewer, so thanks for that. And the idea, I don't know what happened, the uh, different sites, uh, they've been doing some maintenance and things haven't popped up. This would be a total gem to be missing out on. If you are into woodland creatures, be it fae or anything else, it appears that the scale is set so that the creatures are small and then the things that they pick up to use their armor are normal sized. So you have antlers, bones, that kind of thing that look gigantic in comparison. Or maybe you could make it part of whatever the world you're using is where they really are gigantic uh, um, creatures that are dead that they're using the bones of in a weird post-apocalyptic way, maybe or after the dragons all die or whatever the case is. That part is up to you. They are very well sculpted. Um, they look very, very interesting, and you can check them all out. There is a pretty big selection. They all fit like they're all from the same world, and um, you just have to see if Chris Fisher has anything else available if you want to fill that world out to make it into a full RPG. Otherwise, I think these are going to look really good for individual characters um, or as something that you paint up that is really special on your shelf. Then from the Fae, we have my favorite bad guys. These are undead skeletons, but they are specifically for fantasy races, which is nice. So you would have... It's hard to tell if it's an undead elf, right? Because the ears are gone. Because the skeletons, there's no ear, bones in the ear. So, you know, whatever. But they got dwarves, they've got halflings, they've got centaurs. And I believe that's an elf in normal size. So if you did miss out on something, you want to expand out your skeleton horde from something other than human, this is a great opportunity to pick something up. I love the photography that they put together. Look there on the upper right. That's a, how cool does that look? I give them props and put it in there just so you can see that. It looks amazing. Look how stoic and, uh, you know, like, like an undead warrior brought back, you know, as a, you know, as a centaur, but brought back for whatever uh, next task that the gods still have for him. How cool is that? And then we have Worldwide Tennis. So this game, it uses basically uh, the same type of components you would get from Game Crafter, which, you know, isn't that bad of a deal. It means that you can also do a pretty low yield without having to, uh, to worry too much. Um, but what it does let you think about is tennis theories, and you get to play on multiple types of terrain. So there's clay and grass and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I don't know that much about tennis. It's... I play racquetball instead because I always hit the ball way out of the court. So if it's you know enclosed, then it was a lot better for me. Um, but it does let you uh, have a deck of cards in your hand, so you can, uh, depending on your placement on the court, you can do different things, and you whittle down the stamina of your opponent until they finally uh, you score a point. So I'm not sure how it handles fouls and that kind of thing. There is a fair amount of complexity involved in it. But uh, I think if you were trying to teach tennis to someone, this might be a good uh, method, even if it's like a rainy day situation where they would normally want to get out and play tennis, but you want to improve their game by uh, making them think about, you know, placement on the court and all that kind of thing rather than just run for the ball. So, you know, something to think about. Here we go. Lost in Australia. This is something that is very interesting. It's a survival game where you go out and you find metal, wood, that kind of stuff, and you craft it into survival items, and then you have to fight off uh, various Australian um, types of uh, attacks. I'm not sure how many drop bears are in there, but uh, 
the artwork is very stylized in the best way possible. Otherwise, it would be considered very simple. But, you know, you can see just from that shark, it's got a cartoony look, but it evokes emotion. Whereas sometimes you just see these uh, games that are made for the, the younger kids, and it's really flat in the way that they feel. And I think that's, I don't know, it's harder to play as an adult with a kid if it doesn't have at least a little bit of humor. The more that you look at the various art on the various cards, you'll find way more humor involved there, especially the koala. And one of the things you don't know about koala, they are mean. They do not want to be hugged or any of that stuff. They will bite your fingers off right away, and then they make terrible noises. So, uh, you know, when you just see them all cuddly and everything on the WWF uh, um, World Wildlife Fund uh, graphics and all that, you think they're the cutest things in the world. But Australians might feel a little differently about them, um, depending on the, the time of night when they're screaming. And it gets that feel, and I love that, uh, that inclusion of that comedy. Then we have some more really amazing 3D printable models by Yadaro Models. And you're going to need a resin printer for this. They're just too high detailed, but they come in different styles. As you can see on the graphic on the lower uh, left, they have like the... I don't know if it's a tiefling that has the horns, but the one on the, the upper right, it looks like a Dale Keown, uh, one of the early image mo uh, comics uh, figures he uh, he had. I don't remember what it, the name of it was. A pit? Was it the pit? Uh, it was Dale Keown? I'm pretty sure it was Dale Keown. Anyway, um, the, uh, the rest of the models you have on the bottom, on the bottom right, they're more like a Warhammer style, and on the upper uh, right they have more of a fantasy uh, epic monster kind of style. So whatever it is that you're looking for, there's lots of cool things involved. Uh, great for the shelf or something really interesting to throw out there as a modded piece if you want something for a different style of, uh, of war game or tabletop game. But definitely, definitely, there's too much detail. You're going to need resin. Then we have Backwoods, which is a bit like Oregon Trail meets Seventh Continent is the best way I can describe it. You play someone in the Colorado in the 1830s trying to survive in the woods and it is pretty intense as you can see you're gonna lay down um, a map of these tiles as you uh, wander around and you have to find food and shelter and all that kind of stuff and you have a variety of different backgrounds keeping in mind in the 1830s depending on the color of your skin you were not in a good way in the United States um, but maybe in the territories you could have made it and had some different challenges that were involved and uh, I don't think they're going to shy away from all of those uh, types of terrible things that could happen to you um, so just keep that in part in mind but you know it's interesting hey you got a bunch of people of color also not being forgotten so that's a it's something that a lot of folks have been looking for in their games you got it here and the artwork looks good it's um, you know <laughs> I don't want to call it Kincaid style because it's not that uh, idyllic but very colorful um, and you know just the little pieces as you go through and uh, I think seventh continent style as you move through and you, you find these different dangers you're not really looking for mysteries you're just looking to survive but uh, it, to me if you like that game I think you'll like this game then we also have Rise of the Amazons coming to you from Greece itself. So they have a little bit of a better idea of how to pronounce the names of these folks. Um, you're basically looking at Greek mythology from a feminine perspective. So you're going to be playing as Antia, Antianara, Antianera, uh, Penthesilea, Hippolyta, and Alcipi. I do not off the top of my head know anyone other than Hippolyta who had the girdle that uh, Hercules beat. So with that story in mind, you are going to be going against Hercules. You're going to be going against Theseus. You're going to be going against Achilles. You're going to take on a Cerberus, a Sphinx, a Minotaur, a Hydra, all that stuff instead of Bellerophon. You are going to be out there fighting from the feminine perspective all over Greece. And as you can see from the map that's flipping around, so there's a couple of different ways to handle that. And you still get the help and power of the gods. It's nice to be able to have something for people that uh, don't want to just have a um, very homogenous view of who the hero should be, and you want to be able to be inclusive. One of the things it uses, uh, it depends on your, your taste, is it uses busts of the characters. 
and you may want to swap those out for one of the other models that you can get on any of these 3D printable or uh, model specific um, things. Into the Unknown makes great nymph models. I think they would be a great uh, exchange. Otherwise, you could use any of the models here from Heroes from the Colosseum. This is Hybris Disordered Chaos, and it's a, a worker placement game, but it also has uh, some models and things that are kind of cool in there. It's more in line with um, other types of Greek myths and does have male inclusive things in there, as you can see Oedipus, Achilles, and Jason. But Circe and Calypso, uh, maybe they would fit uh, also into whatever it is you're looking for. I don't know why necessarily Greek seems to be super popular all the time, but it is. And uh, especially getting some bigger games that would compete with something like Lords of Elis that I've said in previous episodes is pretty much why I haven't bought um, a lot of these other Greek inspired things, even though I used to teach mythology. And, you know, I know a fair amount uh, on the Greek end, and it's pretty fun. Assassin's Creed Odyssey, the discovery mode for kids great you can run around and play the game looks awesome and beautiful and you can see a lot of the stuff uh, as you visit um, the ruins and and temples and all that kind of thing that you might uh, encounter in these other games other things to know about hybris is that it incorporates steampunk into the ancient greek world for that anachronistic history feel so if you don't want to go super future mix with ancient then you can go steampunk mix with ancient with hybris then we have another Roll and Write. This is Roar and Write, an Animal Kingdom's game where you are going and trying to appease one of five members of an animal council made up of adorable animals, none of which except the tiger that roar. Um, so that being the case, you're going to be pressing your luck and picking uh, one of the requirements for one of these uh, individual animals and uh, rolling dice until you are somehow able to fulfill what that is. One of the cool things I don't think a lot of people talk about that you can do on a roll and write uh, game, especially if you're going to run out or you think you're going to run out, you can just laminate the one of the pages and then write stuff in. It's what I do on like Massive Darkness and anything else that has a pad of paper. Instead of erasing with a pencil, I just laminate a single page and then I use a dry erase marker, wet erase, doesn't matter what it is, and then I, I can just play as many times as I want, and I just end up having these extra stacks for no reason of uh, pads of paper. But that's not a problem. If I want to sell the game off later, you know, then I got that little level of upgrade. If this is something that you think you can play a lot of, and I think that if you are interested in it, that you are going to pay, play a lot of it, because it's a pretty quick and simple game. You can pop out any time and uh, teach your kids math and that kind of thing. So I think you'll have them playing it quite a bit. The lamination method may be the best for you. Then we have a neat game called Sorcerer, and this is the Endbringer expansion. You can get all the original Sorcerer stuff, you can get a lot of new expansion stuff for characters, lineages, and domains. And Solo Play is finally coming to this game. What is it? Well, it's a little bit conceptually a bit like Magic the Gathering in the sense that you are going to play a Sorcerer or a Summoner or whatever you want to be versus another uh, of that same type using magic and spells. Uh, it's a lot more customizable because you get to pick not just character but lineage and domain which offers a lot of permutations uh, and variety. So the artwork is really cool. It is up to par and that's why I keep comparing it with Magic the Gathering. It is about as good as the stuff that you see there but it's obviously not going to have tens of thousands of cards like uh, um, Magic the Gathering has at this point with, you know, it's been what, 30 years? Of, uh, of, a, of a game so it's something new it's something different um, they use a dice mechanic so that is a little bit different so if you're looking for something with more customizability in the type of sorcerer if you're looking for something that also includes dice just something a little bit different and something that has solo play and you were a magic player I think this is something that you should look at then if you're the type of person that can watch Fast and the Furious and not get completely aggravated by the unreality of what they make the cars do, Motorsport might be it for you because it allows you to take those types of cars and make modifications to them and uh, you can just swap things in and out. You don't have to sit there and make considerations like bolt patterns <laughs> and where the holes line up and stuff like that that uh, someone like me that grew up uh, with a family that does racing 
um, every weekend just about has to sit there and have in their brain and consider the engineering aspects of things. So if you just want to be able to, you were a fan of uh, video games that are car driven. Uh, I should uh, is that supposed to, is that a is that a pun? I don't know. It wasn't intended, but you know, like they're they're made around like Forza and what are some of the other ones? Need for Speed. Um, I don't play any of them, but you know those type of things where you just swap things in and out really easily. You don't have to really think about what you're swapping in and out. Then this is the type of car based game for you you got all these different body styles you can pick whatever you want you're not factoring in aerodynamics you're not factoring in anything other than the power that you get from each of the uh, different types of cards cool things it does have is it gets a little granular so you have camshafts and stuff that maybe you weren't really thinking that far in you just thought engine instead of engine piece so it does you know it's like a next step up for those kinds of folks and if you're more interested in the race side, you want to get dirty, then this is Rallyman. It doesn't have as much of customization, but it's got these tiles that make different tracks, which is kind of neat. And um, you roll a dice and race the best you can. One of the things, speaking of dice, I find really interesting is their use of a digital font on the dice. And I wish somebody else would take that of these dice manufacturers and come out with those. You see all these like techno dice and different things. And uh, last week they had one that put a little circuit board looking pieces in the middle of the dice but they didn't use a digital font which I think would enhance that aspect a little bit uh, unfortunately these are specialized and they're only like um, they're like effectively D3s I think and you can't really use them for other games but it is a good idea and I wanted to throw that out there just because I look at a lot of this stuff this is solo playable so you can get the best time that you possibly can by rolling those dice and making whatever other uh, uh, hazards your your uh, your bitch as it were so yeah jump in there's about a thousand other people that would uh, happily join you that have already backed this and uh, get dirty as you drive along then back on the RPG side we have Veil of Ruin which has the possibility to buy all of these cool minis which you don't see on a lot of different adventure books it is a campaign for D&D 5e but it is in the post-apocalyptic version of 5e. Everything's been ruined. I would say closest would be Chult uh, in a Temple of Annihilation, where everything's kind of on the... You know, there's lots of ruins to discover, other types of dungeons to go through, that kind of thing. Um, they look really great, and the reason why they, everything looks so good is because the folks here at Project Dark Water have a ton of previous game experience. They've worked on things like Empire Earth, they've worked on things like Warhammer, they've worked on things that you have probably played, if you're in this space, uh, a fair amount, and they have an idea of what it is that you're looking for. Um, the minis look uh, like they would fit in whatever campaign that you want, you don't have to just keep it to this uh, Veil of Ruin world, so that is always a plus when you're thinking about picking these up. And, uh, you know, a fantasy post-apocalypse sounds great to me then a game where i really wish they would have done more to single out the different minis so you could see it easier i just i got to work with what i got this is wars of oz and it is the oz you were thinking of from frank l Baum. and you have not just the flying monkey folks you have different skeletons you have pumpkin headed archers you have winky sharpshooters you have all the different uh, types of munchkins and uh, they're going to go to war. So all the wars and things that were happening probably before Dorothy arrived in, uh, in Oz are probably what this is about. As you can see, there's uh, a fair, you know, it's a good map. You have the Emerald City off in the side, and then you know, everybody's fighting everything else in between. If you were a fan of Wizard of Oz, not just the movies, but the books, then this is a great opportunity to find something really cool to paint and go nuts with so i think you could go really nuts with the terrain especially because um there were certain things that didn't always just um they weren't just the types of flowers and plant life and roads and all that that you would get here and being able to put a little bit of red, yellow brick road instead of just like a brown and gray one and that kind of thing i think would be a great opportunity for people that want interesting dioramas and things on the table i hope this takes off if you don't uh, like the game itself, I hope you just take the minis and then play Warhammer or something cool with them.
Speaking of odd looking terrain, we have a plant and rock pack. So if you did have a type of terrain that you needed that you can't find, or you just want something to be special and different and alien, then this is a bunch of STLs. So you can pick uh, 50 different models of each type, 10 different complete sets that uh, will allow you to create whatever scatter terrain it is that you're looking for. I don't think that you absolutely have to have an, uh, a resin printer for these. I think FDM might be fine and uh, just make sure that you support it in a way where everything's not going to break off. When you're looking at plants and leaves and that kind of thing, you may up end up in a situation where uh, they break off when you're trying to get the supports off just because they're so fine. You may want to look at orientations, printing upside down, that kind of thing, in order to also defeat where they would droop down. You print it upside down so that you build up and uh, you won't have any problems. Stuff to think about in the 3D world. And I made it known that Irving Finkel is my favorite curator of the British Museum, especially on the British Museum YouTube website. He is the guy that found the rules for the game of Ur and figured out how to play it. It has D3 dice, or maybe they're even D2. Uh, there's, it's a weird dice setup that they created. But uh, it's a basically a racing game where you try to move your group as quickly as possible around this board and exit. And uh, the thing that happens, it's some of the ancient cultures, I forget which one, if it was Minoan or no, whichever one, it was one of those uh, pre-Greek uh, civilizations, they uh, basically stopped fighting and just started playing board games and that became like their Olympics from what we can discover and then they were just annihilated <laughs> because they were too busy playing board games. This is the type of game where it's super addictive if they were playing in a tavern, everyone could just gather around, talk smack, take bets on each other. It's a fun game. And you can watch Irving Finkel, who is this little tiny guy with a giant beard. If he was taller, he would make a great Gandalf. Otherwise, he's just a very uh, keep calm and carry on kind of British man that talks in his own private way. Huge amounts of smack when he's trying to show people how to play this, and you can catch that all on the British Museum channel. It's great. Then we have an ancient game I'm less familiar with. This is Mancala, and it is a very small wooden version of the game. If you wanted to take it with you, it is 4x6, and it's got 48 stones, so you're going to have to have like a little baggie or something in order to keep it uh, from uh, getting messy and dropping everywhere. But uh, if you needed a travel version to take with you camping or something like that, that seems to be what they are promoting in this uh, Kickstarter as its use case. Or you're going to visit relatives or whatever the case is and you want something to keep the kids occupied, then here is a game that goes back to 200, I think 2000 BC is what they uh, advertise it as. I'm not sure, uh, but it's a game from Central Asia you can check out. Then we have a drinking game, and these are kind of a hard sell, even if they're fun. And it looks like it's supposed to be shoots and ladders, but now it's shots and loggers. Um, the hard thing about drinking games is you might have to drive home, and if you're encouraging the drink to the game instead of drink to how you feel, you can easily overdo it. And there's a trend now to get people to not do that, to actually be responsible drinkers. So it's having a hard time getting funded. It's, uh, I think, 5% of the way that it needs to be in order to get funded. If it's something that you're looking forward to, they have Game Crafter parts from the look of it. Um, if they aren't Game Crafter, they could easily be changed into those type of parts to be uh, ready for small print runs. And um, you just keep in contact with the folks here. I've found that Drinking Games kind of has a... Um, an expiration date to when you get out of college or shortly thereafter otherwise you just want to sit and drink and relax you don't want to have to have rules associated with your relaxation so if you're one of those people and you fit within that time frame and you're not going to be out of college by the time this thing ships then maybe this is something for you and you might be interested with your your other young livered friends that uh, folks that are old like me can't really uh, hang with anymore and if you ever wanted to play Exploding Kittens, but you couldn't because they didn't have horses, we have What's That Horse? Because it's very similar in the vein of having these horses that have different personalities, and one of them is Death, uh, per Abraham Simpson. And 
if you uh, want a pretty fast card game that has interesting variety of humor, uh, obviously doesn't have uh, Matt Inman's artwork, but I'd say it's comparable and has a different style. Each one of these horses seems to be very uh, thematic in that sense. And uh, you want to uh, play something quick with your friends and have a bunch of horse puns. You got to print and play. It's not going to cost you a lot and you can get started right away. And if you're not a horse, you're, you're a penguin. That's what we have here straight out of Japan. It is like penguin Jenga. Pengua? Maybe. Uh, anyway, the uh, way that you're building this like glacial tower and you have to put these little ice stones up there and you have the penguins live with you and you use uh, coasters of a sort to uh, help you uh, create the whole thing and make it all work and try and balance it out. I think it's for the exact same crowd as the Jenga people uh, and you can even have some folks that are a little younger as long as uh, they enjoy the Arctic and penguins and uh, you know the Japanese aesthetic. I think it'd be pretty neat. If you want to go full Japan with this, I think you could get some uh, origami paper together and make little origami penguins to go with it and that would be fun too. Most of the weight looks like it comes from the stones so you can make the origami penguins and have no problems whatsoever. And then for those of you finally that love dice, we have more of them. This is the Wild Earth Dice Collection, and they take inspiration from different uh, biomes. So you have uh, the Shimmering Abyss of the Undersea, and you get the blue look. You have the Volcanic Sundering, you get the red look, and you got all different other types. Uh, whatever you find cool, these are sharp, like they would come out of the mineral earth. And, uh, you know, a lot of folks like that kind of aesthetic. So if you're one of those people, here you go. We put a lot of dice up for everybody that likes to have something that signifies their characters or whatever their play style is or just, you know, the feel of themselves. A lot of these shimmer and they have little uh, glitter effects that go along with it to make it uh, a little more special. Uh, when it's color on color, uh, like the red ones, it's a little difficult to read sometimes, but at least they put some of the dark black uh, mixed in with it to make it pop a little bit better so it at least is visible and that's it for your curator of all that's going on on Kickstarter for the first actual week of July but this is what the fourth or fifth that we've had episodes for lots of stuff is there um, if I feel the need to make a supplemental episode in the middle of the week I will otherwise I hope you have whatever holiday of choice that you take up this weekend a happy one and uh, you know stay safe all that kind of cool stuff keep in mind that a lot of uh, things that you wanted to do have been recently closed so uh, if you're in the US at least so keep track of that you might want to look up uh, anything before you make extra plans I'm gonna go to Del Taco as my plan get some chicken soft tacos and then work out and uh, try and watch Hamilton tonight because I've been looking forward to that it's coming on Disney Plus and uh, since I live far, far away from where they actually had the original cast, I think that's a great way to spend my weekend. If there's anything that you want to spend your weekend with, you want to throw in the comments, that's cool. Um, good to hear from everybody. And uh, if you can like and subscribe, that would be great too. I was three subscribers short of my goal of hitting 500 and halfway to monetization for June. But let's hope I get, you know better than that and uh, maybe we'll be able to hit monetization by December because I'd like to be able to get a kickback from the ad dollars instead of asking you guys for money like every other site does out here and uh, we'll see how that goes. You guys have a good one and enjoy your holiday.